So we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about how to prepare for selling your cleaning business and, and when you should start preparing and, and all sorts of things like that. Um, and before we do that, I just I just want to kind of go back to what Dick was just talking about with the due diligence. Now, we were talking about due diligence if you're looking to buy a company, but like he said, these are all things that you need to be thinking of if you are going to be prepared to sell your own company. So, you know, um, the first thing that if if you're going to look to sell your company, you have to be prepared to open up your books. And so people are going to want to see your financials. They're going to look at your account retention rate. So, you know, you need to be really focusing on keeping your accounts long term, whether you're doing residential or commercial cleaning. Um, that's an important factor when people are looking to buy your business. And your employees are another huge factor. You know, the turnover rate, do you have solid um, supervisory personnel in place and solid employees in place? Um, are your accounts profitable? Um, so all of those things work both ways, whether you're looking or you're the one looking at those things or somebody's going to come to your company and start looking at those things at the time that you're going to buy. Now, some of these things, you know, account retention rates and your employees, um, your financials, that's a, like a long-term thing that you need to be thinking of. So it's not something that you can just fix overnight. So if you're thinking about selling at some point in the future, that's something you have to start preparing for way in advance. And so that was one of the first things I just wanted you guys, and I know where, you're, where you stand on this, is how you, um, you know, as far as how to prepare your selling business and, and when to start preparing. So Sharon, do you want to talk about when you should actually start preparing? Right. I mean, that, if, if, can I just interject one thing that we did not mention early on, sure, and that sure. is that you, you got to get a letter of confidentiality signed oh, sure. when you start, right. because you know, because if you're going to, you know, you open the books, and they're going to open the books, and and all of that, and we did not mention that early on, and I guess we should right. have, but you know, that's yeah, the first that's, thing that they, that they will re- keep everything confidential, and right. that you that you will, you know, when you're buying or selling, because uh, it doesn't mean they can't go take your business, but it does mean right. that they can't reveal the information. So I just thought we right. ought to put that on the table before we go on because we do need yes, that. Absolutely. Because, yeah, right. I mean, it's it's a sensitive area. It's hard for people to open up their own books to someone that's coming in mm-hmm. and wanting to see mm-hmm. all this information. Um, and and just briefly, I you know, that didn't mean we had to tell them who all our clients were. It was just right. numbers. That's right. But right. still, you know, right. they're going to want to see your taxes probably for three years, and, you know, that's personal information. And, so, and you know, we right. were always concerned, well, now what's going to happen if this doesn't go through? And, you know, no matter what happens, I want those shredded or, you know. So right. those are all things that you need to talk about, and that's another good reason to have attorneys involved with this to protect you. Um, mhm mhm yeah it's it's very important yeah. and and the listeners i think just really need to know that this is standard operating procedure I and mean, they will be asked to sign something if they're going to be examining someone's books absolutely so so um so we want to talk for a second about a few minutes about when the best time to start getting your business ready and that's really uh, the day you start in your business, whether you, you buy a new one or you start it from scratch, that's really the best time. Because, you know, everybody at some point is going to leave their business. Either it'll be passed on to a family member or someone, it'll be sold, or you may, heaven forbid, become ill and have to close it. Um, there, there are many reasons for you to leave your business, but at some point, everyone who owns a business will be faced with stepping back or not being involved in it any longer. So if you look at your business as an asset, reaching and growing and developing and getting ready for the next person um, to take over, then uh, you'll approach it in a way that's a little more structured and complete. So getting ready to sell your business really starts from day one, from the first day that you set foot and, and own the business. Um, that's when you have your structure and your plans in place so that you are ready when the time comes, whether it's five years or ten years or twenty years down the road, that, you're, that you've got a, a solid asset that you're growing. Right. 
Um, Dick, any anything to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, uh, you know if, if you start you, you run your business every day like you were going to sell it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess the other side of that is you don't sell your business when you just lost a big account, and uh, you don't sell it when you just got a big new account because it, it, the the value is is not there either way. Uh, because I uh, and Sharon, I'm sure you get some too. Call us from. Well, I'm fed up with this business, so you ask right. which big account, which big account did you just lose? And invariably, right. that's when they're ready to sell. You know, and that's right. It, yeah, and uh, so you start preparing. You know, you start preparing for. You, uh, I think anyway. Uh, uh, in my particular case, I, I I really start making a very diligent effort, a diligent effort, about three years before I sold. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I just said we're we're going to be wanting to sell about in this area you know, of the year. I mean, I had pretty much where I wanted to sell and when, and uh, so we really started making sure everything was in order. Then, not that it was out of order, it just we just you know start doing our own due diligence inside and say if somebody looked at this, you know, how would they perceive it? So our, right. our last three years, which I guess reinforces what we said earlier. You know, is that you need to you need to be looking at your business, and you know, also from the standpoint that somebody looks at this to buy, uh, how are they going to look at that? Right. You know, what, is, what does it really right. say? So, I, I guess you know, we all say we should start when we buy when we start the company is when you start trying to sell it. But I guess my my rule of thumb is you know, most of us are not probably dealing with doing that. But, you know, right. it's a process. It's a two- or three-year process. Well, would you please Right. And, 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 it, and I would agree. And it's, and it's like a house. You know, if you're trying to sell a house, the more work there is to do to the house, the less money you're going to reap for it when you sell it. So when things are in order and repaired and fixed, you can command a higher price. And that's the very same thing with a business. Um, you know, in my case, I bought a business that was – uh, it distressed somewhat, and um, the buyers or sellers were ready to get out. My purpose in buying it was to build it, grow it, and sell it for a profit. So it was almost like flipping a house. Um, and it obviously took longer than it does to, to do that with a house. But um, the point was that I had to restructure from the beginning because I knew my ultimate goal was to sell it and at a point um, where I could do well financially with it. And so, well, you know, yeah, and I think this brings up another point, Sharon, along with that, is that, you know, a lot of us just say, well, we're going to pass it on to our kids. I want my kids to have this business. i got news for you. The kids don't necessarily want that business. Exactly. Uh, I, I was going to say, I, I, I know that you've had that problem, and I know someone else that is in that same boat. He thought for sure his son was going to take over, and it's not happening, and now he doesn't know what to do. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I had I had three children and none of them wanted it, you know. Right. One kind of, one of them kind of wanted it, but he couldn't have run it, you know. But anyway, right. uh, I mean, he he, he was a, he's a great kid. I love him to death, but he probably wouldn't have done well running the size of operation that we had. Is really what I meant. But right. but anyway, but they don't necessarily they just don't necessarily want it. So you're going to be right. separated from that business either through death or the kids don't want it. Or you know right. your best general manager doesn't want it, so um, you got to look at it from the standpoint you start preparing to sell it because and if the kids right. want it, great, you've got a great asset to give them. But if they don't, you've got a great asset to sell. You know, so. Correct. Right. Correct. Well, I want to bring Steve in to this conversation, <laughs> and I want to move on to the next topic because um, you know, the, and that is, should you use a broker or not? And if you don't use a broker, how are you going to find people to buy your business? So Steve and I have sold two companies. The first one we did with a broker. The second one we didn't. So Steve, can you just talk about our reasoning behind all of that? Well, our our first one, you know, that was about uh, twelve or thirteen years ago. And uh, that's when we were out in Boise, Idaho, and we decided to come back to the Midwest. And at that time, we didn't have a clue on how to sell the business or exactly what to do with it or anything. So uh, we decided to contact a business broker at that time, and you know that helped us helped us get educated on that whole process. Uh, so it was a smart thing for us to do at the time. 
you know, uh, a broker obviously is going to take their percentage. I think it was eight or ten percent that they took of the sale. Uh, so you got to be pre- be prepared for that. And but it was a, it was a smart thing for us to do. So we learned the process. They pretty much took care of everything. They found buyers for us. And in that situation, they actually had a buyer uh, within weeks, I believe it was. And, yeah, it was fast. Uh, yeah, the the first uh, the first deal actually fell through. Uh, we started because we started seeing some things that we felt were red flags, and we called them on it. And uh, obviously, uh, it uh, I believe we closed the deal down. Um, yeah, then, the fir- with the first one, it was they were not coming up with enough money down. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah, we, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, remember we wanted to make sure that our assets were covered, and then the rest was kind of blue sky. What you're getting paid for for the accounts. And they just weren't coming up with enough cash down, and we didn't feel comfortable with that. So we so we just said no. We were going to stand firm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you have to and be. Was, you have to stick with what you believe in too, and you have to be prepared to say no because it's hard. I mean, you got somebody offering you to buy your business, and you think, oh, I'm just going to jump on that, but not necessarily. You gotta you gotta pay attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I was talking actually about the second uh, uh, group of people that came through to, to yeah. purchase it, um, and uh, yeah, that there that deal we actually closed down, and then lo and behold, the first buyer came back around and they sweetened the pie, so they actually came back to us with a number that we could live with, and we actually went ahead and closed that deal with them. Um, on our second business that we did in uh, '09 when we sold that, uh, we did not use a broker for that deal. Uh, we did use our business attorney, though, to help close the deal. So in the long run, you know, we did save a little bit of money, you know, as far as the cost uh, in that respect. Um, and, you know, from our the first deal that we did, we obviously learned quite a bit and felt pretty confident that, uh, that we could do this deal uh, without a broker and just using our attorney. Um, and the one thing was is that we we already knew who we were going to sell to in our second business. Uh, we actually had a, a company that came to our town, and they wanted to get market share. So it was really a no-brainer. That's who we called, and a week later we were sitting in their office, and then I think seven, eight months later we actually finalized the deal. So that was our situation uh, with uh, using using a broker and not using a broker. Right. You know, and, and going back to our first one, Steve mentioned that um, the second offer that we had, we turned down. We were working through. This was a case where, um, similar to Sharon's situation, where someone who wasn't from the industry was making an offer on the business. It was two guys that are in the insurance business, and one was going to run it, and one was, you know, quote unquote, the money man. <laughs> Although they weren't made of money, believe me, and. Um, they were, uh, you know, it was just a little, there was a concern with the non-compete and and we're like, why do you care about the non-compete? We're moving to Minnesota. And and pretty soon it came time for payroll and it was close to closing day and we're like, you know, you guys are sticking on this really dumb point and our employees need to be paid tomorrow. So if you're not going to get over this so that we can get our employees paid, we're not doing the deal. And we stuck to our guns, and we refused to do the deal, and it fell through. And our broker was like, you know, come on back to the table. And we're like, no. <laughs> and and then a week later, our broker calls and says, well, the other guys are back. So, yeah, that's that's how that turned out. But, um, yeah, and then, like you said, in the second one, um, the, it was, again, I mean, we knew, like Steve said, we knew who to call when we were going to sell the second one. Because when they came into town, they were trying to get our business. They were going to our clients trying to get our business away from them. So we're like, well, we know they want the market share because <laughs> so, mm-hmm. they keep going after our clients and they weren't able to get them. So they, they knew ahead of time that we were solid because they weren't able to steal our clients away. So um, so anyway, that's um, Dick, I, I wanted to bring you in on this quickly too because um, this is you talked briefly about it earlier about having using a broker in our own industry. Um, yeah. If you want to yeah. just finish yeah, up with I, that. Uh, I, I, I guess using a broker, I'm, I'm, a real, I'm a real fan of using a broker and I, I guess it depends a little bit on your personality, but... Uh, by using a broker that was familiar with our business, I happened to sell to a company 
I, I just may, you may find this hard to believe, but I'm a Type A personality, and uh, the uh, company that I was selling to, the president of that company, is Type A also. And uh, so we got into, you know, we we kind of got heated sometimes, and we actually got to the point where the, the the deal was called off. We had the deal, and then there were a few minor points, and we just neither one of us would give in, and. Uh, and Gary, I mentioned Gary Penrod before, he just let us cool our heels. And then after about two or three weeks, he called and he said, okay, now everybody's over there, over there mad. You want to start up again? And we started up again, and probably the deal was probably done in a week, you know, once we, but what I'm saying is had we tried to do it ourselves, we'd have probably never sold the company, at least to that that company that bought it, because, you know, we were both kind of headstrong, and uh, we weren't going to give, but we had an intermediary come in and kind of look at both sides of this thing and said, this deal ought to be happen. You know, you're a good buyer, you're a good seller, and da, da, da. So uh, I'm really, uh, I, 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 it, it depends on the size of the deal, too. You know, um, if it's a really small company, it can probably be done without a broker. But if you've got a pretty good size company, the, uh, Steve mentioned earlier that, you know, you pay a commission to an intermediary to do it, and uh, if they do a good job, they're worth every nickel of it. I mean, they really are, because they can walk you through that. And and uh, well, it's kind of like Sharon mentioned selling a house. You know, you don't you, know, you, you use somebody to sell your house, and they, they barter back and forth. Here's the offer. Here's my counter offer. Da da da. You know, and right. uh, I I really think that uh, and I did I I bought. Uh, both of the companies that I actually bought in Phoenix, I bought without a broker because they came to me, and they weren't that big a company, but they helped companies, but they did help us with market share. And uh, we did, though, use our a CPA that knew what they were doing, and then we used a, a um, an attorney that was a merger and acquisition attorney for both of those. But uh, that's because they came to us, but... If you're really anxious to sell your company, get somebody that that knows the industry, knows the, the business. I had a company I was going to buy, and uh, we shook hands on the deal. The man had terminal cancer, had about three to six months to live. He wanted it to be sold to a reputable firm, uh, and it allowed us to buy market share in a different city. He and I agreed on the deal. I drove back, which was about two hours back from my home office. I got back, and his accountant had uh, got a hold of him and said, oh, you don't want to sell for that much. And, uh, you, you know, in our accounting, in, in the accounting industry, we can get, you know, eight times annual sales. Well, you know, Sharon, you and I can't. <laughs> if we could have sold for eight times annual sales, we'd have sold a long time ago. You got that right. Yeah, yeah so... <laughs> You know, some people just don't understand, uh, you know, what the, you know, how the how it works in our industry, and that's why I like somebody right. kind of experienced in what we're doing. So that's kind right. of where I'm coming from on it, Gene. I'll shut up and we can go on. Okay, <laughs> and we're going to get into that in a minute here. So I guess the next thing I was going to bring up was more about the due diligence, but I think we kind of covered that. Was Steve? Was there mm-hmm. anything else that we didn't really discuss when it comes, you know, to due diligence? No, I think they we hit it pretty pretty well, you know, because uh, they are going to ask about uh, you know the account retention and your employees, and uh, you know, and as Dick said, you know, they may not hire all your employees. You know, they may decide to go ahead and interview every one of them and decide which one is a good fit for their team. And yeah. Uh, so yeah, you know, uh, so I think we did cover it pretty well. Uh, mm-hmm. the, I think the the one thing is <coughs> we'll talk a little later about. Uh, about maybe holdbacks and stuff, but, but yeah, as far as due diligence, I think we got it covered pretty good. Okay, so yeah, it's right. just kind of opening up things for your business, and and as I mentioned, um, you know, if, um, they they want to have an idea of how many accounts you have, how much volume each of those accounts are doing, how long they've you've had those accounts, so what's the retention like? So you can put that information into a spreadsheet and make it anonymous so that they don't get the names of those accounts or the names of those customers. Right. 
Um, and then you've got a spreadsheet of every customer, and, and, and that's the information that you would give them then. And they don't get those names until the deal's, you know, solid, so, or, or well, done. And, and I, would, I would mention that an astute buyer, people that are in the industry that know what they're doing, don't care about the names. They want to look at the numbers. Right, and if, right. somebody, if somebody is very diligent, I got to have the name of the account before I'll buy yeah. it, and they're not really a buyer. No, you know, they're, you're right. They just want to. They're just wanting to get information from you. So, well, uh, if they know you, agents. if they know you, they're going to know who at least some of your co- accounts are yeah. anyway. But yeah. right. Well, some right. of the other information that they that they may ask about is uh, uh, consumables. You know. Uh, more and more companies now are selling uh, paper products and consumable products to their clients, and you know some companies are making uh, some pretty decent money just in that in that portion of their business. So that'll be something else to think about. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. So the big question that everybody wants to know: <laughs> What's my business really <laughs> worth? <laughs> and the first thing that I will say and that we can all probably agree on, is that it's never what you think it's worth. <laughs> um, you know, the first time we went to the broker, it was it was a good learning experience because, and that's another reason to go to a broker that's experienced at it because um, they're going to be able to give you a realistic valuation of your business. And if you've never sold a business before, I can probably almost guarantee that you're, in your mind it's worth more than what you're going to find out it's really worth. And mm-hmm. in the end, it's really only worth what someone's willing to pay for it. And a lot of that has to do with timing, and, and of course it has to do with all the preparation that you've done. So, I mean, just because someone says in the LinkedIn group that, well, you can just figure you know, three times your monthly revenue – um, oh, okay, well, then that's what my business is worth. Well, you know, there's so many variables that are involved and all that, um, you know, client retention and all that stuff, that all has uh, that has something to do with what the value of your company really is. So, okay, you guys, how are we going to, you know, how do, you, how do we figure out what my business is really worth? 